Well, I'm super excited. Uh, we have a start of a new uh, summer series. It's entitled Pro- Promoted by a Promise. You see right here, I'm excited for a lot of reasons. Absolutely love the, the promo slide. Uh, Jim, uh, he's the one that created that. As you can see, it's, it's not only you've got to uh, focus upon the globe, but Lord, it, it's, it's like there's an arrow going up, like we're beseeching God, expecting something from God, and the arrow coming down, and they meet. And that's absolutely, I think, a great picture of the book of Acts. Because it is, it is about a, a global purpose, but it's also about this thing that God has brought into our lives where I, I really truly believe that we have been promoted by, uh, by a promise. We're going to be talking about that, not only throughout the series, but through this morning as well. And the title of the message today is Gains Henceforth. I'll explain that later on. You know me with my titles. But I'm excited about this uh, summer series simply because it's summer, right? I mean, we're in summer and it's great. It's like it's finally here. It's, it just seems so great. But I love the book of Acts. I just got done listening to all 28 chapters about a week ago. And just, it's just so absolutely rich. And so as we're looking at starting, I think the, the best thing I can do is kind of give you an introduction to the, to the book of Acts. And it crashed. Okay, so we're, we're in crash mode. So, uh, so let me just explain a little bit about the kind of the, the, what the book of Acts is, the layout of that. Uh, first of all, it's, it's, a second, it's a second account that is written by Luke. Luke wrote the, the gospel, of course, the gospel of Luke. And his second writing was the book of Acts. And the scripture tells us this, that, that he, he wrote it of all the things that Christ began to do and teach. And so he, in, in, the, in the gospel, you see the life of Jesus. But in the book of Acts, we see it's kind of you have turned the corner. What you're seeing here is how Christ is still doing except he's doing from his church. He's doing through his church in a glorious and wonderful way, and so we, we begin to see that. We, we realize that the, the book of Acts, if you were to study, is the third largest book in, in the New Testament. Uh, Luke is the first. And if you look at the book of Acts, it, it is over a span of 30 years. So it's, it really is unique, I think, in its, its scope. And what it tells about, it stands all by itself in its content of church history. Uh, Whether you look at the book of Acts, you're going to see, first of all, the task of the early church. And the task is that they were called to step into the world with uh, vivaciously empowerment by the Holy Spirit, where they would, they would take the, the gospel to the, uh, to, the, to the ends of the earth. That was, that was the target. And they begin to press out into that target. And they did it with a sense of joyful determination, not like, oh, great, guys, we got an overwhelming task ahead of us. It's like, man, they were excited about what God was doing and doing in them and through them. And so it tells about the task of the early church, but also the tale of the early church. And by, by that, I, I mean this book kind of reads, reads like a book, chapter to chapter, right? And you see the different accounts and what are taking place. And if you were to look at it and and if this was cooperating with me this morning, you would, you'd see several things. You would see that this is a, really speaks of a new era of believing where God's people are empowered by the Holy Spirit just as prophesied by the prophet Joel. We see that in Acts chapter 2. And by that, by that promise, this empowerment, we see new life, we see new power, we see a new spiritual awareness that takes place. That's the book of Acts. For today even. And then secondly, we see it stresses the importance of fellowship within the body of Christ. If you look at chapter 2, verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread in prayer. I, I love that. The focus really is on the body of Christ interacting. What you're probably going to see very soon is you're going to see a new arrangement of our chairs. We're purposely going to kind of do things a little different. It's going to be more in a big U shape. Why? Because we're also not only looking intentionally switching things up a little bit here, we're going to really take more time through this series to be sensitive to the Spirit and what He want to say and do in our midst. So there's going to be times where we're going to be preaching and then we're going to have practicum. It's like, okay, Lord, what do you want to do and what are you saying? So we want you to be open to that process. We know it's going to be a change. You may not even like the change at first. I don't like the layout of the chairs. We ask you to bear with us because we want to press in together 
And so we want to encourage you for that. We, we really are out on a running start on this book of Acts. So that's, by the way, why I've got my sneakers on, just in case you're wondering. Yeah, I'm, not as, I'm not as quick on my feet as Laurel, but that's the reason why. It also announces a powerful move of God to bring new life to the lost. It tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it says, And those that accepted this message were baptized, and about 3,000 souls were added in one day. Man, it's about new life, about new believers coming to Christ. It's also a book that radically tells us that Christ can change your life like, like nothing else and nobody else. And we look at, the, we look at one chapter, in chapter 9, we see the conversion of Saul, the sheep-beating, embittered, hard-crusted man out, out, out to just ruin the church and how God smote him by the grace of, by his grace and he absolutely melted in the presence of God and became a vessel of God. Just powerful. We're going to see that. It also records the vitality of the Christian faith as it outgrew severe limitations of prejudice and cultural bias as we see that in Acts chapter 15 and how God was literally changing the perspective of the early church so that they could get a world perspective of what was on God's heart. And then we see also it places the value of the testimony of a single life to God. Do you know this, that God has great value in your life? And on your testimony, your witness, what God wants to do in your life is a profound thing. And I believe that by the promise that we're going to talk about today, that, that has Christ set before us that we can have a promotion. Even today, you can. And he can radically change your life. If you feel like you're a stuck man, that's a deception. It's a beginning. And there's always beginnings with Christ. And then we begin to look at the date. The date is somewhere between 62 and 65 AD. That's important because it's before the fall of Jerusalem that happened in 70 AD. It's before the persecution of Christians by Nero, which happened in 65 AD. And if you go to the end of the chapter, chapter 28, you see there that you see Paul is still alive. So that means he wasn't beheaded by Nero, which traditionally is stated that that happened in 67 AD. So that's kind of the dating of that. The, the person that it was written to was Theophilus. Theophilus is a Greek name. It's comprised of two Greek words, theos and philos. Theos is God, philos is love. So it was written to a God lover. Some people think it was an educated Gentile aristocrat. Others see this, that it's to God lovers in general. And if it's to God lovers in general, do you know what that means? That means that this is to you. And this was written to a high, wide audience of people. There were believers, non-believers. There were Jews and there were Gentiles. But I, I want to tell you this, folks. Is, as I'm looking at this book and the layout of this, you're going to hear a lot of teaching Some of you say, ah, I was hoping for more preaching. There is a little bit of a difference there, right? I want to ask you this. How many people live out in the country? And you get mail delivered out in the country? Do you care if it comes in a ratty mail truck or if it comes in a Corvette? No? It doesn't make a difference, does it? It can come with anything in between, right? Regardless of what you think of that. You may think, "I I like the ratty mail truck. The thing is, as we present to you the book of Acts... We're, we're hoping to deliver the word to you. It doesn't make a difference how it comes, right? As long as it's got your name on it. As long as it's set right in, in your lap and you open up and say, this is mine. And that's what we're hoping for is that we're going through this series that you are literally looking at what the Spirit of God is, was doing in the early church and wants to do now. And you're saying, I got mail, baby. This is mine. And that's really what we're what we're hoping for as we're looking at going through this. Also, I want to share this slide with you. It's kind of a breakdown of the purpose of the book of Acts and, and why it was written. First of all, it was written to proclaim the complete account of Christ's work. As I said before, the book of Luke talks about the ministry of Christ. The book of Acts talks about the ministry of Christ today through believers' lives. Believers then, still being written. We're probably going to hear a close on this. Dave Coles, I think he's going to do our last week. He's going to be talking about Acts 29 in the book of 28 chapters. That's your day, folks. That's your day. 
And then we also see and understand that Christianity wasn't illegal. That may not make a great difference to you, but that literally is largely why this was written, so that that could be proclaimed. The next thing is it also records the spread. You see, this is going to be an acronym here, P-U-R, purpose. It records the spread of the gospel and, and, and it tracked and how it went from Jerusalem to Rome and how, and how the outer reaches are already beginning to happen. It is also to pronounce Paul's innocence, which at the end of the chapter we see that he still is a man who, is, who has not been, uh, a, you know, he's been arrested, but he has not been convicted of any, any charges that were illegal. We get an overview of church history, I think a powerful overview. We, it follows the movements of the church at that time, the rise of leaders, and how the Spirit of God was advancing the kingdom of God. It's the overview of that. And then also it shows the vital beginning of Christianity. In fact, in Acts chapter 11, it says, that in, it talks about the, the believers and how they were called Christians. That was the first time it was used. It's talking about the birth of something profound that you and I have the same DNA in us as what was taking place then. But what I, what I love, and I kept this for last, it explains the Holy Spirit's work upon the church that is inexhaustible and unquenchable. And you're going to hear about a move of God that can be here about us now. And that the church today can be as legendary as the church of that time. And I believe the church, church is legendary in a lot of places throughout the globe, globe. And so we see this is the, the purpose. Now, if I was to go through and give you a, a layout, a chapter-to-chapter chapter layout of the book of Acts of how the Holy Spirit was working in people's lives, it would look just about like this. That there's power for witnessing. There were speaking in other tongues. There was dreams and visions and prophecy that was uttered in lame people that were walking in a boldness that was rare. Signs and wonders done. Demons cast. Healings experienced. Angelic uh, intervention. Divine deliverance. Incredible wisdom, the divine fixation. I love Stephen being stoned to death. And all he's seeing is, is Jesus seated at the right hand of God the Father. Man, he's just fixed upon the glory of Christ. What a great way to go out. We see sight restored. We see uh, uh, paralytics healed. We see the dead raised. We see guidance given, events predicted, joy manifested, even in the midst of trials and struggles. We see cripples that were made well, counsel that was given, encouragement received, purpose granted, extraordinary miracles witnessed, callings received, appointments given, words of knowledge spoken, and and proclamations declared. You can read the 28 chapters for yourself. You'll see this. What is this? This is how the Holy Spirit works upon the church of God, upon God's people. And And these were a people that were entitled to this package. And we have the same entitlement. The exact same entitlement. What the Spirit of God was doing then, He can do in our midst. And somehow we have to begin to think out of the box of our own experience and realize that this spiritual macro burst that sat down upon that church like a mighty rushing wind is something that can still blow across our congregation and that we too, as that early church, can be promoted by a promise that was made to them. Are you with me? Are you kind of catching the vision of the book of Acts, why I'm excited? Folks, there's about seven years ago, I spiritually derailed. There's something that happened in my life, knocked me flat for two years. I had a disappointment. I was dejected in my spirit. I think part of me that I've been even kind of prolonged almost maybe in some kind of spiritual famine for seven years. And I'm going through the book of Acts and I'm getting excited. And I'm thinking, Lord, do I have seven years of plenty ahead of me? And, and I'm beginning to think, how much of this is for me? How much of this is for you? How much of this is for us as a congregation? And dare we, do we believe for something, an upgrade of sorts, as we gather this summer? looking to God, looking that we too could be promoted by a promise and that we could have gains from this time forth forever, always pressing ahead to what God wants to do. So I want to start by looking at the book of Acts. That's just the introduction. We're looking at Acts chapter 1, 
I'm going to read verses 1 to 8. I've condensed it to that. It's not the whole chapter. Best I can give to you with the time I've got this morning. In the first book of Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had been given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. And he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And as we look at this text and the breakdown of it, Lord, we pray it would be life and inspiration to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I start expounding upon these verses this morning, you might be thinking, what does he want from me? I really don't want anything from you, folks, so relax. But this is what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping that as we look at this summer, and you hear the message today, you can poise yourself for gains and say, is there something that God wants to set in my life today that's going to move me into a new tomorrow? And as I look at Jesus, he made a promise, and Jesus was strong about his promise. When Jesus projects the things, he promises a thing, he proclaims a thing, it arrives exactly as he had intended it to be. And, and there's something about this that I love. I love, the, I love our title slide, Promoted by a Promise. Absolutely love it. And when you think of promotion, you have to say, okay, what, what is it? What does it look like? Well, it looks like, you know, my life was defined by weakness and now it's defined by a power. I, I, I wandered aimlessly about, and now i have incredibly led by the Spirit of God in my life. I, I was sensing uh, dejection, and now I'm, I'm sensing strength and power. I'm, I was maybe a God-fearing person and had some kind of respect for the things of God, but now I'm a God-filled person. There's a difference. We see this through, throughout the book. And there's just something powerful as we're, we're looking at this Promotion, and I think some of those are the, the sweetest upgrades you can ever find in life, folks. I mean, we look for the, the, the better job, the more money, but, but imagine what God wants to do, really, in your, your life as you really let him and you respond to the initiatives of the Spirit of God. And as we, we look at this, we see that this is a book, it's called the, the book of Acts because the, because the disciples hacked it. And it was called the book of Acts because the Holy Spirit acted upon them. And that's the reality of this book as it's laid before us. And and as we read it with an understanding that this promise is for us, I I believe that we can experience gains. And and I'm looking forward to those gains. And so we look at verse 1. It tells us, it tells us going back, it tells us the first book and some translation says in the first account. And the account is a systematic presentation of facts and principles for conclusions that are to be reached. What's that mean? It means like, man, there's stuff that he wants to do in our lives and we need to settle down and look and see what it is and respond to him with a real sensitivity of heart. You know, as you look at Christianity, it's not a call to mindless faith expressions. It's, it's a call to look at the facts and examine the facts and as we, part of that is looking at the life of Jesus, not only what he did, but what he came to do and the promise that he looked to set upon his people. And that's what we're looking. We're taking that into account. And so it's so, so important. If you look at Jesus, it told about all that 
he began to do and teach. You know this, that we preach a life package or we don't preach at all? Either the life comes in alignment with the teaching or the, almost the teaching is invalid. There has to be a sense where truth is living and abiding in us. And then we see in verse 3 that Christianity has the ability to appeal to to the intellect and the reasoning powers because of the many convincing proofs. And as you look at the scriptures, what are the convincing proofs? Well, the convincing proofs is that Joseph's tomb in which Jesus was buried was empty. The convincing proofs that there were more than 500 eyewitnesses of the resurrected Jesus. The convincing proof is that there were miracles that happened after his resurrection, such as the time when John 21, where he said to his disciples, Peter, who is putzing around because he's dejected, and he says to Peter, he says, I want you to cast your net to the right, and there's going to be a catch of fish there for you. I mean, this guy fished all around him all night long. And the fact is that Jesus not only did pre-resurrection miracles, he even, did, he, even, he even resurrected himself. And then, and then afterwards, we see Jesus doing miracles. And I think there's something of miracles that we still can expect today. You know, as we take initiative by the Holy Spirit of God. And so we see these powerful things. We also see convincing proof as Jesus eradicated, it seems to eradicate all the doubts of the disciples that they had. They finally came to a place of understanding where they were like, man, we get it. And God was moving powerfully in their midst. And as we look at the resurrection, the resurrection is, is powerful. That's part of the convincing proofs. Because without the resurrection, first of all, there is no foundation for living. The scripture says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. Not only that, but without the resurrection, there's no power over sin. The scripture says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless for you're still in your sins. And so as we understand this resurrection and the theme, the central nature of that to our belief, it becomes not only our foundation for living, our understanding of the Old Testament and its projections of looking at the, the promise that, that God was going to give us through, through a son that would have victory over death. And this is what we're, we're seeing Then we also, Scripture says that he spoke to them in verse 3 about the kingdom of God. And that refers to God's absolute sovereignty over human affairs and history, over life. That that he has absolute sovereignty, not only on a global level, but on on an eternal state. It's like, as far as the charts can see, he's sovereign Lord and then beyond. And this is what he began to show them. He began to talk about the kingdom of God. And when Jesus first came, what we see is this, that he invaded this age with his kingdom. And when he comes again, he's absolutely going to consume this age with his kingdom. And that's something to look forward to. In between those two comings, in between those two spaces, we proclaim the promise. And we live the promise. This is our hour and our time. And then we look at verse 4. They were told to wait for the promise that the, that the Father had said he would give. And so the scripture says there that, that, this, that this promise was for spiritual power. And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. How many of you are struggling with weaknesses? You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. I, I think our weaknesses need to be put in a place where, okay, Lord, what do you want to do powerfully in our life? And so we're, we, we see that here as well. The scripture talks about a baptism of the Spirit, and that's, that thought is important. To be baptized means to be totally immersed. It means that you're, that, that you're absolutely surrounded and covered over by the influence of the Spirit of God in your life. And how you come to that place, that's the question. How do you come to a place where the Spirit of God is moving powerfully? It says you surrender to Jesus both as Savior and Lord. It means you can't deal with the sin issue in your life, but he can deal with the sin issue in your life. And he can make you right before God. And then he can work marvelously in your life, marvelously as you allow him to be Lord in all of the circumstances of life. And that's what we see with baptism. And 
as we're looking, verse 6, we see a response of the, the disciples. They begin to say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. And what we're looking at here is really important because, because God was doing something new and these guys are still stuck in an old train of thought. Do you know how often that happens? Is that God's in the, in the, absolutely, the wheels are turning, things are in motion, God's doing something new, we're still thinking old things. And we're living by old ways and patterns and expectations. And so the, the question is this, is do you have faith for God to do something new and powerful in your life today? And when you see it, are you looking to step into that? And that was the challenge before the disciples, and that's why they were to wait, and they got it. It just took them a few days in order to get it. And so the thing is this, is that he wants to empower you, he wants to impassion you, and he wants you to experience gains in your life, and he wants you to be a witness for him. And that's what this Holy Spirit is about. And you'll become my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. We had a prayer meeting two weeks ago. Pastor Jim opened up and he talked about boldness. He talked about a rare boldness. And then he, he did something I thought was very strategic. And those of you that were in that meeting will remember this. He said this. He said, what keeps us from being bold witnesses? And the answers that came from the room were absolutely brilliant. And I want to share 10 of those with you this morning. And they're absolutely brilliant. And some of them were by others, some that as I was sitting there, I was just listening and putting down. I think these are some of the 10 most reasons that keep us from having a boldness in the spirit. The first is a lack of mental space in our heads for mission possibilities. I thought that was great. And it's like, do you ever wake up in the morning and saying, Lord, what mission do you have for me today? You see, that's making mental space for God to do something profoundly in your life. Some of you might lack a starting point of communication. I mean, how do you still start telling someone about Jesus? Well, I think probably some of the first place you'd start is just by talking to somebody, right? And begin to open up in a dialogue, a conversation, enter in with you functioning from the mental space that, listen, maybe I'm on a mission here. Maybe they're going to be open up to the, to the gospel or something that I'm going to share of the things of God's heart. Some of you might lack an imagination of thinking of how God would possibly enter into that person's life for a breakthrough, right? It's like, ah, God could never do that in their lives. Why not? And then we see the fourth thing, a lack of preparedness. And I just think there's something, sometimes we get up in the morning, there's a readiness that we need to have in getting ourselves engaged for the mission. Lord, what do you have for me today? The fifth thing is a lack of a sense of authority. Do you realize that the power that he gives is his power? And that you and I could actually function on more authority spiritually than what we're assessing currently in our lives. And the next thing is the lack of passion. And I, I was reading a book recently by... Dawson Trotman about his life. And this is a man absolutely in passion for souls. And I'm going to continue to peek through that, hoping that there's something that's contagious to me. And I begin to think that way as well. Then there's a lack of an openness of mind. Maybe you have already written somebody off. You have a bit of prejudice in your thinking, and you're thinking, oh, that person, no, nope, they're way too far. They're way too bad for him to, to bring into place of light. And then we realize Look at the Apostle Paul, which we'll be looking at in this series. How about a lack of heart equivalence? We sing a song here, Hosanna. It's like, break my heart with the things that breaks yours. Do you have the heart equivalence where you're compelled by the love of God? For the love of Christ compels us? Heart equivalence. The number nine is a lack of your witnessing edge. Maybe, maybe you have shared your faith in the past and there was resistance. And you shared it again, and there was resistance. And you shared it again, and it was a resistance. And it was like, the, it's like scraping a knife on the edge of a stone. And after a while, you lost the dull edge. What do you need to do? 
And you sharpen that thing up again. <laughs> Try again, right? Maybe you won't hit stone next time. And the last one is lack of planning for new need-based vicinities. That, this might sound a bit strange, but, but the perfect example, I think, is this gal who sits over here, Laurel. I mean, when she came into the North Country, began to look around, and what are some of the needs? There's kids that are hungry in the weekends. Hmm. So she started a ministry called Snack Pack, the Snack Pack Program. And with that, she's, she's had the opportunity to talk about her faith, all kinds of people. Why? Because she was moving in the vicinity of, of a place where there was a need, and she parked there. And she began to see God work in a powerful way. Folks, the scripture tells us that we shall be witnesses. That's our business. That's our promotion. And that's part of the gains that I think that God wants us to believe for. And as you look at the book of Acts, it's layout. You're going to see that the disciples were urgent about being witnesses. They were current about it. They were witnesses with a vision. They had a global sense. They were seeing beyond. And they were witnesses with functioning with the power of God. There's a quote I want to share with you at closing, and it's by Brooks, uh, uh, Phillips Brooks. He was a clergy back in the late 1800s. Powerful. And it has to do with being uh, empowered for a task. He said, oh, do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger. Do not pray for task equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your task. And then the doing of your work shall be no miracle, but you shall be a miracle. And every day you shall wonder at yourself at the riches of life which have come to you by the grace of God. I love that quote. And in the spirit, I really believe we can expect something new and something different and something more because we were made in Christ to be promoted by a promise and to experience gains now henceforth. And that's the introduction to the book of Acts. So I want you to be patient with us as we go forth looking at 12 weeks of looking at 28 chapters and how we dice that up. We want you to join us this summer, not only in coming, but in prayerful expectation. Is like, God, what do you want to do in our midst? That's something new and something powerful and something releasing. At this time, I'd like to have the music team come forth. Perhaps we would be able to raise to our feet with something of expectation as we close this service this morning. And I'd like to pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for... The promise of your spirit, Lord, we thank you that what we read in the book of Acts, you've called us to be part of. And Lord, it might be a different day, but I really do believe that the manifestations of your spirit still are looking to move powerfully in our midst and beyond. Lord, we want you to use us, to prepare us. We pray you to be working in us, Lord, that we would say, Lord, what are the new gains that you have for me? How can I enter into them? How can I press into them? How can I be a powerful witness for your kingdom. Lord, open me up and work in me and move for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.